Today we're going to uh, start a moral theory. We're going to start talking about moral theory. That's called utilitarianism. And we're spending two weeks on this. And this is a major moral theory. And you might ask, why did you put it off until the end of the semester then, Dr. Sandler? Well, because historically it comes later than, say, virtue ethics or natural law or even this, you know, Hobbesian contractarian ethics. And things like egoism or what we've called authoritarianism, those have always been with us. You can look at any primitive society and then any society that has a literary tradition and a higher developed you know, civilization, and you can find some people advocating, hey, everybody ought to get what's good for them and forget everybody else, or, or saying, you know, well, whoever's in charge, they get to decide what's right and wrong. Um, and then every society that develops a literary tradition, I think you can find something sort of like virtue ethics. They, they don't come, come right out and call it a virtue, necessarily. But you can find it cross-culturally. <coughs> Utilitarianism, you can actually find ideas like this, not just in the West, but also, say, in Chinese philosophy, um, with, with uh, Moism, um, way back in the day. And you can also find some sort of precursors of this in Western philosophy. But to make it into an actual moral theory that has its own name and a sort of tradition to, to it, that's still going on very strong today, that didn't happen until the modern era. And we're going to talk about this guy, Jeremy Bentham, first. But he's not the only important utilitarian. There's also John Stuart Mill, who we're going to look at uh, next week. And then over, we're going to carry him over uh, Thanksgiving break. And then there were some other important ones who we're not going to study, like Henry Sidgwick. And there's actually a contemporary um, philosopher, Peter Singer. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's kind of a famous guy. Um, we can talk a little bit about him if we have if we have some time. Um, he's actually been just down the road at the culinary because he does a lot of things with, with talking about food and hunger and how we ought to treat that. So utilitarianism is a major philosophy, and we'll look at all of its traits. But before we do that, let's do a little bit of review. Think about, with each moral theory that you can come up with, and we're going to go through the list of the ones we know, you can think of what is its highest moral ideal? What is the thing that really makes it tick? And you think about when you're finished with this course, and you're done here at Marist, and you graduate, and you go on to whatever job you're going to, uh, what are you going to carry with you? Well, when it comes to moral theories, how much of it are you going to remember? What are you going to remember? Are you going to remember that, you know, on page 76, John Stuart Mill said X, Y, Z? Probably not, right? You're going to remember certain ideas. And knowing what the highest or most important, the thing it values the most, um, idea for a philosophy, that's pretty useful, don't you think? Um, so, what are some of the moral theories that we've talked about this semester so far? You're just scratching your head, you're not raising your hand. Uh, what are some of the moral, yeah? We've talked about virtue ethics, where you... Okay. Um, so, Aristotle, so. So, right. Aristotle and Plato and to Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas brought a new spin to it, do you remember? Anyone remember what that was? His ethics is a virtue ethics, but it's also another kind of ethics. Anyone remember off here? Sure, it was just a couple weeks ago, right? But it was in his, uh, um, kind of like the authoritarian. His was. Uh, although he talked about power, so let's put. Um, and remember, too, th there could be better names for this. I just picked authoritarian because it has to do with authority. Thrasymachus, in Book One of the Republic, was a great representative of that. You might 
consider Hobbes to be along those lines? Although Hobbes also had another idea in mind. What, what other ethical theories have you guys learned or thought about or explored in this class? Yeah. Contractarianism? Yeah, Hobbes would fit into that, right? Um, and if you remember back to Book Two of the Republic, um, there was some discussion of something sort of like, well, we, we get together and we, you know, we make rules and agreements. Um, so that kind of looks like contract here. Isn't it? What else? Yeah. Egoism. So Egoism. Egoism, yeah. I'm a little bit hard of hearing today. Um, everything seems kind of muffled, unfortunately. So yeah, egoism. Uh, we saw that in the Republic, right? Uh, and Hobbes seems to start there. Uh, Aristotle treats something like that. Uh, do you know why all these moral theorists discuss egoism? There's always egoists, right? It's a sort of basic human starting point. Um, and how many of you have ever babysat? Or, or, you know, like, had to watch your little brother or sister? Um, the attitude of a kid is essentially egoistic. What's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine too, you know? When they're a certain age, and then we try to get them to come out of that. And some kids do, and some kids don't. Okay, um, okay so utilitarianism, virtue ethics, authoritarian, authoritarian ethics, contractarian ethics, egoism, are we leaving anything out? Um, oh, uh, Thomas was about natural law, right? And then we also have this thing that we call the divine command theory. And if you had to like boil it down into one or two things, <coughs> virtue ethics, about what? Virtues. Virtues. Okay, so what's the opposite of a virtue? Vice. And if you wanted to be, you know, very pithy and prosaic with this, you know, putting it in very short terms, be virtuous, don't be vicious. You want to be virtuous, look at what virtuous people do. Don't want to be vicious, don't act like those people over there, you know. Um, when it comes to, say, specific virtues like generosity, look at the way generous people actually make their decisions and then start modeling your decisions after theirs. Um, if you had to boil down this, this sort of notion that Thrasymic has had with authoritarianism into a few words, what would you, what would you maybe say? This is how you'll tell whether you're retaining this stuff. Yeah. Might makes right? Yeah, I think that's, that's just fine. I mean, it's... Uh, not a trademarked phrase, it's, you know, uh, and I think that does capture it pretty well. Might makes right, so moral norms, what's right and wrong, or good and bad, ultimately comes down to us from some authority. So, you know, if you don't like the way that it's set up, get, get yourself in charge so you can make the rules, right? Um, how about contractarianism? One single phrase or idea to try to boil that down into. I understand this is oversimplifying, right? Yeah. Um, maybe a few of you are reluctant to, to do damage to the theories by oversimplifying that, but yeah. it's, it's good to do this sometimes. Yeah. I don't know, it just uh, be, um, I think it'd be more like a social agreement type thing, like uh, okay. we're going to agree to get along. Sometimes we call this a, this is why it's called contract here, a social contract, right? And what's the worst thing you could possibly do according to social contract theory? Break the contract. Exactly, because if you do, it, anything goes, at least for Hobbes, right? There are some versions where it's not quite so uh, nature, bloody and tooth and claw, uh, or nasty, brutish and short, as, as what we explored just a couple classes ago. What about egoism? If you had to sum that up in a phrase. 
I have a phrase in mind. Look out for number one. <laughs> Who's number one? I am. <laughs> you are if you're the egoist. I'm number one if I'm the egoist, right? Um, look out for number one. Um, natural law theory. This one's a little tougher, isn't it, to come up with a, a nice, easy, quick statement for that. Um, maybe let's pass over that. Actually, you know, let's put something else. Oh, you have, you have a suggestion? So, like, within everyone, there's an innate sense of good and evil. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's right. Uh, according to natural law, we have inclinations that reveal to us what we ought to do. How would we make it, um, how would we condense that? It's tough to do, I think. Let me, let me replace natural law with another one that we have talked about here and there, but um, we didn't get to look at one of the main representatives, Epicurus, hedonism. Um, hedonism says that pleasure is, is the good. Um, Maybe eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah, for tomorrow we die. It's one of Shakespeare's plays, I think. Drink, merry. And then what about divine uh, command theory? What's good is what God tells you is good. What's bad is what God tells you is bad. The key thing to do then seems to be to figure out what God actually wants. Oh, I know we could put for that. <clears throat> Assuming, of course, we're talking about a Christian culture, right? Not a said Muslim culture or Hindu culture. Um, we've all seen these WWJD bracelets, <laughs> bumper stickers. Actually, though, it wouldn't necessarily be what would Jesus do. It would be, what would Jesus command? What would Jesus say you have to do? But now, you, you know, I suppose you could say, well, he, he did say at some points, do the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So that could fall under that. But I think for a divine command, to make it more broad, you could just be like, uh, what would the religion do? Rather than what would Jesus do? It would be you know, more like, what would our religion expect of us? OK. What? <laughs> okay, so now, now you notice these are all things that you could easily say. Um, somebody asks you, what's, what's <coughs> virtue ethics? And all three years from now, I hope that you remember virtues and vices, right? Um, if, if you only remember one thing from it, that's what to carry forth because that'll, that can help you remember other things. Or this might makes right action. Um, you're going to come across that. You're going to come across all of these in the workplace that you go to, guaranteed. Some people will be operating with one moral theory, some people will be operating with another, some people will be kind of conflicted and mixed up about it. You may actually be able to bring some illumination to it. So what about utilitarianism? Well, utilitarianism actually has its own sort of catchphrase. Uh, by the time that we get to, to this point in time, people are kind of savvy to that. And uh, it gets talked about in terms of the greatest happiness. Uh, and we can add to that overall. So what's really distinctive about utilitarianism, if we want to talk about it in a broad sense, is it looks at whatever community is being um, discussed, presented, and it asks what's good for the community overall. But when it asks that, it asks that about the individuals. What's good? Say if we're, the, we're this community. You know, there's um, 6, 10, 17, there's 21, 21 students, one professor, so 22 people in here. Um, <clears throat> what's best for these 22 people overall? Now, we could find some things that are good for 
the majority of us, but aren't good for some minority, right? Um, what about evenly balanced as far as men and women? Um, the biggest imbalance in the class would, of course, be students, professors. Only one professor, there's 21 students. Um, <coughs> If I was a, a consistent utilitarian, which I'm not, but if I was, then one of the things that I want to do is structure my classes and structure this classroom itself so that it promotes the greatest happiness overall. Right? So that each, each one of you would count just as much as, as me, which that I don't have a problem with. Um, and we would try to set things up so that um, even if it would make me unhappy, it would make you guys happy. Or at least the majority of you happy. Like, for instance, uh, you know, what, what are some things that professors do when they want to get on your good side? You guys have been around the block. What do they do? Uh, they try to cut classes down for like skip a class, like oh, we want class Thursday or something. Really? Here that happens? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that happened at, at, at other places I taught, where like professors would actually come to an arrangement with the students and say, "Yeah, we're going to get out 15 minutes early every class." Everybody's okay with that, right? Yeah. Um, and and why are they okay with it? Well, because you know that's more enjoyable, right? Um, and especially if the person's a really boring lecturer. Well, that would be, you, you might actually be doing the students a favor then, right? Um, sometimes people show a lot of movies. Students like watching movies. Mm -hmm. Professors like watching movies too, you know why? Not only do we enjoy the same things as, as the rest of you, why else might professors enjoy airing movies in class? You don't have to talk as much. You don't have to talk at all. You just have to say how well these principles that we've been studying are illustrated in the matrix, you know, or, or whatever. I'd like you to devote your attention to the screen in front of you, and then you go sit in the back, and it's, it's an easy day for you. Uh, what else? I could maybe, somebody had suggested this earlier in the semester, I should bring in donuts, which I might do at one point or another. Um, uh, what else do professors do? Well, you, you get the idea, right? I could make you guys very happy by doing certain things. Those might not actually be the best things to do, um, but it really depends on what outlook you're taking. What is the goal here? What constitutes the greatest happiness? That's sort of the catchphrase. Now let's actually explore that. And I'm gonna erase most of these. There we go. Um, why didn't I erase hedonism? Well, utilitarianism is a variety of hedonism. So when you're reading through your Bentham, you remember the very first thing that he said was kind of a flowery phrase. You know, mankind has two masters, pleasure and pain. Um, well, that tells you what he thinks is most important. And we've talked a lot about moral values over the course of the semester and different goods and different bad things. Um, utilitarianism is a type of hedonism. It says that pleasure is the good. Pain is the bad or evil. So everything that we think is good or evil really comes down to certain kinds of pleasure and pain and a higher balance of, of pleasure against pain is what we think of as goodness. And a higher balance of pain versus pleasure is what we think of as badness or, or evil. That's what a hedonist is committed to. Um, in a way, it's, it's kind of, you can think of it as an unmasking philosophy. It's sort of saying, all these great high ideals that you say that, that are more important than pleasure, why are you into those? What do you get out of those? What do you see in them? A different kind of pleasure. How many, for instance, of, how many of you like reading books? 
You read books for, for their own sake, not just, you know, because you're assigned them. About half the class, right? Uh, that's pretty good. Um, now, if I ask you, why do you read those books? Why do you read those books? Is it a good thing? Yeah. Entertainment. Say again? Entertainment. Entertainment, okay. Entertainment is, I think, a kind of pleasure. Um, so, you know, for instance, I, well, I actually like reading philosophy books. That's probably why I became a philosophy professor. You, you might not, right? Um, and there are certain philosophy books that I, I find really, really deadly boring. And I, I don't read them for fun. I read them because I have to. Um, when I want to read things for fun, I read science fiction <coughs> or fantasy or um, some classic novels. You know, I like plays a lot. Um, but I do that because they, they provide me pleasure. Um, do I get anything more out of them? Yeah, if you're a good reader, all, I think all of you have encountered this. There's, for every one of you, there's some book that you've read that you connected with, and it changed your life in some way. Is that fair to say? It wasn't just because you, you had so much fun reading it at the time. and said, wow, this is a really great story. Can't wait to find out the end. Um, there was some idea there. Something that, and it may not have been you know, put in philosophical terms or, or anything like that, but there was something that you latched onto, some thought that you carried forth from it, and you, you molded over. And if we expand this to songs and to movies and TV shows and sitting around you know, chewing the fat with your friends or your family, <coughs> there have been some ideas in your lifetime that have captivated and there's going to be more. That's the good news. Um, were you just engaged with them because they were pleasant? Um, somebody like a virtue ethicist would say, no. You engaged with these ideas because they awoke the human potential in you. They, they made you feel in some way more alive because your, your rationality, your mind, is part of who you are. You know, if, if you found something being awoken in you, some, some ideas spilling forth, um, and you, you, know, you liked that, you thought that was something good, um, you weren't just doing it because it was pleasant like drinking coffee or drinking beer or uh, laying in, in a, you know, a nice warm bed until 10 o'clock in the morning. You know, frankly, that's probably half of us would rather be doing right now, right? Or, um, laying out in the, the nice warm sun, sunbathing, or pick whatever kinds of pleasures you want. Playing with ideas is not really that kind of pleasure. But could it still just be a, a higher type of pleasure? A more refined kind of pleasure? I think sometimes with pleasure you have to look at the end result, not necessarily mm. what you've done to go up to that point. Okay. That's a good, a good point, and that's actually going to take us forward a little bit. So if pleasure is the good, and there's lots of different kinds of pleasures, and we can compare them against each other, right? Um, like for instance, would I, if, if you ask me, um, which do you prefer more? You can't have both of these. Would you prefer to read the Marist, uh, Student newspaper, The Circle, new copies out there available, or drink some, some nice coffee. Um, quite frankly, today, I would say I'd rather drink the coffee. There's other days where I would, I would rather, you know, become well informed and <laughs> find out what's going on on campus. But, you know, today's not one of them. Right now I really want my coffee. Um, there's certain pleasures that I want. Or, you know, we could compare pains against each other, right? Would you rather um, have the pain of burning your finger, uh, your coffee or something like that, or feel the pain of turning on those commercials and you see the, the starving children? You should feel pain when you see that, right? If you don't, you know, maybe you lack sympathy. Uh, those are both kinds of pain. Um, which, I don't even know which one I would prefer. Oh, well, the thing with the TV, if you change the channel, you know, you... 
Well, let's assume you know, you're stuck you watching it. Yeah. Well, you can recover quicker from it. You have more control over it. Okay. Well, how then, you recover from it rather than a paper or a burn or something like that. Yeah. You kind well, of that's good too. Because you notice what's going on. You're making distinctions. You're saying, here's why this would be a worse pain. Here's why this would not be as bad of a pain. There's certain characteristics. But to go back to one of the things that you said, you've got pleasure and pain of all different ranges as good and bad things, right? And you, you could actually balance them off against each other. You could say, hey, would you accept this amount of pleasure if this amount of pain comes with it? You know? um, or will you do this if we can dull this pain? Like, you know, I, I'll go to the dentist, but I'm not going to get my teeth drilled if I don't get Novocaine. Um, you know, I suppose if it got really, if I had a, a toothache and it got really, really bad, and I was in terrible pain, and the dentist didn't have any Novocaine, I might say, go ahead and drill. But it would have to be pretty bad for me to get to that point. I imagine the rest of you are probably like that, too, right? Um, So we have all these different kinds of pleasures and pains. Then we have things that are not by themselves necessarily pleasure, pleasurable or painful, but they lead to pleasure and pain. Right? Like this piece of chalk, for example. Does any of you get pleasure out of chalk by itself? You like the taste or feel of it in your hand or you know, the sound it makes when we drop it and it cracks on the floor. This could bring you pleasure, though, right? Can you think of any ways it, it possibly could? I can think of a whole bunch, some of them kind of, kind of silly. Um, like, you know, let's say you didn't like somebody. You could write something on the board about them. So and so is a, you could draw a picture, too. You know, um, that would, you know, if you really didn't like somebody, that would bring you pleasure. Or maybe it brings you pleasure to, you know, draw a nice you know, mural before people come into class. I've had students do this. And then you come in and people say, oh, that's really, that's really nice. And they don't even know that it's you because you didn't sign it. And you feel that sort of uh, joy at your, your artwork being highly regarded. Um, that could bring you pleasure. Could this bring you pain in any way? No? Somebody say no? And what if you swallowed it? I doubt it would bring you pleasure. <laughs> or you, you, you know, you're, um, you're running in the hall and you accidentally poke yourself in the eye with it. That would be a lot of pain. Um, this doesn't have any pleasure or pain in it by itself. It's what it could lead to. Right? And there's a lot of things out there. We've talked about money before. right? Does money have any intrinsic value? No. Why do you want money? The leads and things with intrinsic value. Yeah, it's good for stuff. How many? How many of you feel better when you have a lot of money in your in your account or wallet? Not not all of you do. I'm surprised. Um, most most of you at least do. Yeah, because you you realize that that money can bring you pleasure or help you to avoid pain. Um, now this ability to produce pleasure or this likelihood or tendency to produce pleasure is where we get utilitarianism, utilitarianism from because of this whole idea of utility. Utility is the tendency to produce pleasure or to remove pain. So does being in this class have any utility for you? It may not actually have. It may not actually bring you a lot of pleasure right now. Um, is there a purpose for you to be in this class? We've looked at this question before. What What is your reason for being here? Just had nothing better to do at eight o'clock Monday mornings. Yeah. Yeah, to graduate in some cases. Mm -hmm. I think everybody here needs it to be actually, right? Um, you may have you know, said, yeah, I always wanted to know a little bit about ethics, but that, that's, you know, I think probably a secondary consideration. Hopefully by the end of the semester, that's become a primary consideration, but 
that's that's up to me to, to make happen, um, not not you know you to come in the class, right? Um, so this class is useful for something, and, and actually, is graduating. I suppose you have some pleasure when you graduate, right? Walk across the stage, parents are there, the rest of your family, you'll feel what? Happy. Happy, yeah. Proud. Um, like you've accomplished something. That's that's pleasure. So this has some utility, right? Um, and, and with a lot of things in life, you can ask yourself, do they have positive utility or I guess you could say negative utility as well? Um, when you make decisions about what you're gonna buy, you do a cost do you ever do a cost benefit analysis? Or like a T chart? Do you guys know what a T chart is with the pros and cons? Probably have been doing that since you were a kid, because your parents made you do it. You know, to try to teach you, you know, responsibility or something like that. Or maybe your teachers did. Um, well, what you're doing in there is something very similar to utilitarianism, but what you're ultimately basing it on are pleasures and pains. If you're a utilitarian, so think about um, any given thing that you do during the week. What are what are some of the things that you make decisions about? Well, uh, showing up to, to football practice, right? Um, or, or soccer practice, or, or basketball, or you know, what other teams they have here? Volleyball? I don't know. We must have a whole bunch of teams here. Um, how do you decide whether to take off a day or not? I mean, you could say, well, the coach doesn't want me. You know, you're an adult, right? What sort of decision-making process goes on? I'm, I'm sure there's some days where you say, not again, I don't want to do this. Is that true? I think every athlete goes through that, and I think every student goes through that. Um, you could actually make yourself I'll use this as an example. You have a decision to make. Go to practice. Or skip practice. Um, and if you're going to skip practice, you have to figure out what else you would do in that situation. Skip practice and go to bed. Um, skip practice. What else might you do instead of skip practice? We'll, we'll put go to bed as one. <coughs> Some days you just want to sleep, right? What else might you do instead of... You might actually say, well hell, if I'm going to skip practice, I better make it worth my while. I'm going out. I'm not going to do something, right? So what, so what do you want to put in the other slot? Go out? OK. Um, so we have three different options. Option A, go to practice. Option B, go to bed. Option C, there we go. go out. Um, now what we would do if we were utilitarians is we'd start looking at things in terms of pleasures and pains. And we would do this first for, for one of the people who's affected, which would be you. This is your decision that you're making. Um, what, sort of, what sort of pleasures would there be in going to practice that you could think of? Make you a better athlete or better at your position. Okay. Um, or role on the team. Keep making progress, let's say. Progress as athletes. Um, what did you say about a team? Something about a team. I said uh, maybe improve your role as a team, maybe like a leadership role or something. Oh, that might... yeah. That, okay. So. Possibly improve leadership role. I mean, you can't get any better in a sport without actually doing it, right? It's like a musical instrument. If you, if you buy a guitar um, and the guitar just sits there, you're not going to become a guitarist. <laughs> um, and actually, learning a musical instrument a lot of really mind-numbing, boring stuff to, to acquire the skills that you need. I 
kind of scales, arpeggios, learning all these chords and finger positions. And athletics is a lot like that too, isn't it? All these drills that you have to do. And, you know, you don't scrimmage every day, do you? Um, anything else you can think of? What other pleasures? Or what, what about pains? Are there any pains in going to practice? Body hurts. Yeah. And <laughs> if that's a good practice, you are going to be sore afterwards, right? Actually, you might even feel terrible during the middle of the practice. You might throw up, you know, you, you might fall out. Um, who knows? If it's a pretty physical sport, somebody might clock you accidentally or even on purpose. Um, Well, let's, in order to keep this really simple, we'll just, we'll just go with this. Okay, so what about going to bed? Any pains involved in going to bed? Bed sores. <laughs> yeah, you really do an awful lot of it, I suppose. You won't be an athlete for long if you're in bed long enough to get bed sores. Okay, we'll put that down to the possibility. Possibly, and so um, What else? What are some more yeah. likely, likely possible? The coach could have consequences. Oh for yeah. Skipping practice. See, there could be a pain involved, right? You know, the coach comes down on you. Uh, um, why would you do it then? Feels good to sleep. I remember one time uh, I used to run a lot and um, was doing a lot of training for different things. And, and a friend of mine, he wanted to do a 10 mile run, and it was like the middle of summer, and it had to be like 105 degrees that day. And so, you know, it was like 18, 19 years old. So we go out and we do this, this, this run. <clears throat> and it takes, you know, a couple hours. And by the time that we were done, you know, we were just totally dead. And my mom had baked this, uh, this whole um, platter of, of lasagna. And uh, so we come into the house and she said, hey, you want to have a little lasagna? And uh, we said, yeah, yeah, sounds good because we're, you know, very hungry because we've been running for, you know, two and a half hours or so. And we ate the whole thing. And then, you know, what happens immediately after you eat starchy foods and you've been exercising a lot? We slept for like, you know, we, we actually just laid on the floor. And I remember waking up when she came home and she, you know, wanted to know where all of her lasagna was. Mm -hmm. um, which I think she baked for something. Um, but it felt so good. <laughs> you know, just laying there on the floor. That was intense pleasure, right? Um, what about going out? You might, some of this might transfer, right? The coach comes down on you, especially if, you know, the coach sees you up at Darby's or something like that. Wants to know, what are you doing? Where are you in practice today? Um, you're not going to get bed sores from going out. There could be some other pains that, that happen with it, some possible things. You might get in a fight, uh, even without meaning to. Um, it could be in a terrible car accident. Um, what are some other possi possible side effects of going out? Um, you more tired than you were before? Yeah, you'll, you'll probably, I'm assuming going out means what? Like drinking, going to a bar or something like that. Um, so you'll probably be hung over. Well, even since we're talking about sleeping in, it'd be like a morning activity. So if you're like walking all yeah. day or something, you know. You could be t more tired as well, because I don't think you. Oh, if you walk to the bar again, or I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I follow. Well, you would say, uh, well, because you're contemplating sleeping in or yeah. getting up early to go out. I don't know how many people go out at ten o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the no, morning. No, this is this is like after after class. I, I should specify. So after class, you, should, you know, it's the afternoon. Are you going to go to practice like you're supposed to? Or are you going to say I'm going to take a nap? Or are you going to go up? Um, 
maybe do what they call pre-gaming, right? Uh, now, why do people do it? Do they do it just, well, I'm going to get hung over. That's negative. Why do people go out and, and go up the road to these bars? Socialize with friends. And okay, so socializing, that's actually a pleasure, right? Bentham talks about that. He talks about the pleasures of conviviality. Um, what else? Why do people drink? Uh, other than ones who are addicted and you know now have to do it daily or else they don't function. Why do people like to do that? There's a physical pleasure, right? That comes with that. So there's some physical pleasures. And some people, you know, drink the things that they, they drink because they like the taste of them. You know? Um, you can go to fancy bars where they have all sorts of gourmet beers. And <clears throat> if you're into wine, you know, there's like a million different types of great wine that you can try. I, I don't have the palate for that, unfortunately, to know what I'm, what I'm drinking. Um, to tell whether, you know, I should be saying, oh, this is very good or not. Um, other people like, you know, other, other things. Um, now, with each of these, do you think that you could assign some sort of value to them? Like a numerical value. Bentham talks about a couple different things that would have to go into this. Um, one would be intensity, right? Are some of these pleasures more intense than others? Or some of the, some of the pains more intense than others? Like, I've never had bed sores. But I'm willing to bet that it, 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 it's pretty painful. Uh, I've been hung over, and that can be mildly painful, or that can be terribly painful, depending on how much you did the night before. Um, coach coming down on you, that can be painful, I, in a psychological way, right? I, mean, I don't mean like the coach comes in and, wow, get to work, you know, starts beating you or something like that. But, you know, say, feeling like you're losing the respect of somebody who you, who you yourself respect, um, that can be painful. Um, the soreness that you feel afterwards, I think, you know, with physical pain, how many of you have ever, like, been in the hospital for, for one thing, or like the emergency room, like you cut yourself? Now, they didn't used to do this, but... What do they do now with pain? They ask you, on a one to say again? A scale of one to ten. On a scale of one to ten, how painful is this? What they're doing is they're asking you to evaluate the intensity of the pain. They don't say, is it a throbbing pain? Is it a burning pain? Or something like that. They want to know the numerical value because they need to know how <coughs> bad it is for you. Do you think you could do that with pleasure? Do you think you could could evaluate pleasures against each other and maybe come up with a, uh, a scale. What, what do you think, um, think about all the different pleasures you experience. What would you say is really a really intense pleasure? It could be physical, it could be psychological. What's the most pleasant thing you've ever experienced? achieving a goal. Yeah, the sort of satisfaction that comes with, with like everything coming together, that can be very pleasurable. People, you know, that can be so pleasurable, people can get addicted to that. Um, what else? Winning. Yeah, winning a, winning a game, especially if it's a close game, really good opponent, and you pull it through. And, and again, that, that I, I've experienced this when you're on a team, and somehow there's those moments where everybody seems to be like on the same page um, and you can just see things happening. That feels really, really good. Um, that ha also happens with music too, by the way. With your, when you're playing with other musicians and somehow you, you know exactly what they're going to be doing. Um, that feels really good. Uh, what are other intense kinds of pleasures? Could you rate foods against each other? How many of you eat in the cafeteria here? Only a few of you? Oh, we can't use that as an example. How many of you eat across the street at some of those restaurants? Only a few of you. <laughs> Where the rest of you eat? Uh, home. <laughs> home? Okay. What do you guys like to eat? Uh, chicken 
harm. Okay, I like chicken parmesan. Okay, that, that's... How many people in here like chicken parmesan? Um, okay, so that, that, that provides us a useful point of comparison. A really good chicken parmesan. What size would you want? Let's make it really tasty. Got fries. What's better, what's better than fries? Some pasta. Some pasta to go with it, yeah. Really, done really well. Not like the, you know, it's boiled too much or anything like that. So chicken parmesan, some really good pasta. Let's see at a scale of 1 to 10. Where would you put that on, on, on pleasures? We don't often think like this, right? But if you want to do the utilitarian sort of thing, you have to, you have to start calculating how intense pleasures are. There's other things too. What about duration? What about time? Um, some pleasures last longer and some pleasures don't last very long. So the chicken parmesan, how long does that last you? 20 minutes. Yeah, and you probably eat slower than I do. For me, it may not even last that long. I picked up the bad habit while I was in the army of eating very fast and uh, never really broke it. What are some more lasting pleasures? Things that will stick with you for a while longer than a good meal. I mean, it's interesting. A good meal is one of those few products where it's an, art, it's an artistic production and it's designed to be destroyed. And if it's not destroyed, it didn't do its job well, right? And it's designed to no longer exist when you are done. Um, what about a, a really, well, how many of you buy music? How many of you have bought music in the last month or so? Um, do you say to yourself when you buy that music, um, I'm okay with only having this, this MP3 for a week. <coughs> do, you, do you rent music? Anybody in here? No? Why not? Because it's something that if you like listen to it, you're going to want to listen to it over and over again. Yeah. Maybe not back to back, but definitely later on you're going to want to hear it again. So. You can't have the same chicken parmesan over and over again, because it only exists once. Um, but you can listen to the same song, and people often do this, when they first buy a CD, and there's one song they like, and they play it over and over and over again, why did, why did, they can do that, and that pleasure continues for a long time. What, what would be some other pleasures that could continue a longer time? Well, you know, think about this, making progress in something, uh, physical or psychological, or that's a long-standing pleasure. That would make a pleasure more valuable, wouldn't it? Um, so intensity, duration. Uh, what else comes in there? Uh, what else is important? Bentham actually uh, tells us about this. Certainty or uncertainty. Let's talk about the bed sores thing again, right? Not likely you're going to get bed sores from sleeping in uh, one day. Um, but it could happen. There's a very slim outside chance. You, you could also fall out of bed. Um, if you're in a bunk bed, the top thing could collapse on you, and that would produce a lot of pain. Uh, but these are not great likelihoods. Um, going out, um, some things are pretty certain. If you drink too much, you are going to be hung over. That's just physical um, mechanics, right? Um, why do people often go out? What are, what are they hoping for? Other than just having a good time. Why else do people go to bars? Drink. To meet people. To meet people. And is that something that you can bet on happening? You're going to go to the bar, and you're definitely going to meet somebody. Well, yeah, if you made a date. If you said, I'm going to meet you here. <laughs> but. Um, <coughs> Is that a certain pleasure? Is that absolute, absolutely 100%? Well, I mean, if you go out you, and you say hi to somebody and talk to somebody, you're going to meet them. Oh, yeah. You know? But I think we have but something. If you, to get it past the point of uh, like a short conversation, it's... To make a know, connection, yeah. It's not as guaranteed as going out and being able to get drunk. True, yeah. 
I mean, the, the, the being able to go out and get drunk, that's pretty certain so long as you've got money in your wallet and you don't, you know, get the bouncers angry at you or something, right? Uh, but yeah, being able to meet somebody, pick, pick anywhere you want, that's not as predictable. And that could be a really great pleasure. Um, having a great relationship, you know, across all these things, that would encompass a lot of pleasures. Relationships can also be the source of greatest pains, too, right? When they go bad, they can cover the entire spectrum. Um, with any given relationship that you have, you could probably get some sort of assessment of it, right? You do this in real life when you say, I don't think this is going anywhere, or this is the one. You're making a, a kind of prediction. And if you're a utilitarian, if that person is the one, it's because they bring you greater pleasure than they do pain. That's, that's the way you, you make your decision. Um, Bentham talks about some other characteristics of pleasures, too, that we, we can think about. But what I want to hit on um, the most is we've looked at how something might affect one person so far. Utilitarianism is different than plain hedonism. The hedonist would say, okay, do that sort of calculation, figure out what your pleasures are, what your pains are going to be. Um, but you don't have to take other people necessarily into consideration, do you? I mean, how many of you care about what other people think? The rest of you don't care what other people think? What they, bless you. How they feel? How they're affected by your actions? I, I kind of doubt that. I think probably all of you care about what, what other people think to some degree. Um, do you ever feel pain because somebody thinks badly of you? I mean, it depends what it is. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. Um, you might feel like if you did, actually did something bad and then people don't, you know, they don't trust you because you actually did something bad. You can understand that, right? But if you didn't do anything bad, and they just don't like you, and they won't give you a chance, that's going to make you feel worse, right? Um, with utilitarianism, other people's pleasures and pains matter as much as your own. With hedonism, you only care about other people's pleasures and pains insofar as they affect you. So really, if you don't care what other people think, you don't have to take them into consideration as a hedonist. If it does bother you that other people think badly of you, or it does make you feel good that other people think well of you, um, or a friendship is you know, something important to you as a hedonist, then you would actually take stock of other people. For, you to, for a utilitarian, if taking a broader perspective, you say, well, we've got to look at everybody affected. So think about different kinds of communities. Um, you have families, right? If a parent um, gets transferred or gets a job offer that requires them to move to a different state, who's affected? The rest of the family? Yeah, so who would, who would that be? Uh, spouse, kids. Let's use parents. this one as an example. So you got, you got um, one spouse, another spouse. Let's say there's two kids, right? We'll call them Bobby. <laughs> and uh, let's say Wilma is being transferred. Uh, now, what you would do is you would look at the pleasures and pains that are going to result for each one of these people. And let's say we're going to sort of assign arbitrary numbers just to make it very, very simple. We're really doing what we're supposed to do as a utilitarian. We go through this long step-by-step uh, -step process. But, um, Wilma is going to get a great job opportunity. She's going to move up in, in position. So let's say um, it's, we're somehow quantifying the pleasure. Right? It's worth 50 hedons. This is one of the terms that the utilitarians like to use from that word for pleasure. Now, how, how would this affect the other spouse? 
They have to move to Houston, now the fourth largest city in the United States. Could be positive. Maybe there's more jobs for them there. Too. Okay. Yeah, so it is a. So let's say. A lot of companies. Let, let's actually say it is. Let's assume. Uh, and now it's not completely certain, so we're not going to give it as high of value. Let's say it's like plus 20. And they didn't really like living in the Hudson Valley anyway. You know, but Bobby and Susie have a lot of friends here. And this is where they go to school. And this is what they're used to experiencing. And Texas is pretty hot. Especially in the summer. And Houston is not, you know, it's not a nice walking town like these towns are, right? So let's say Bobby and Susie are really, really upset by this. Um, really upset. Well, what does this tell you? That woman shouldn't take the job? Yeah. Um, now, if we if we start tweaking this and we say, well, um, we'll we'll buy each of you um, probably too young for a car. What would you bribe the kid with if you were in this situation? PlayStation certainly wouldn't be enough, right? I probably already have a PlayStation. What could you bribe them? Um, Their own rooms, maybe. Okay, so we're, right now they don't have their own rooms. Bobby and Susie actually have to share a room, which is, you know, getting kind of inconvenient because they're, they're they're both getting older. So now you start sweetening the deal, and now it's only negative forty. Um, still outweighs the positive benefits to the other spouses. You, sh you should still say don't go, right? Because you're considering the entire community. You can keep in touch with them on Facebook. And what if we bought you each an iPhone? So you could text them whenever you want. Uh, or, you know, can you think of anything else along those lines? So now, you know, Bobby and Susie are starting to say, yeah, that, that's not so, so bad. It's a bit of inconvenience. But now, what happens? It's, it's tilted to the other way, isn't it? Now imagine this on a larger scale. Think about political decisions. Think about any contentious topic that we're talking about. Um, like, for instance, should the one of the one of the things that's on the table right now, both because of the Obama administration and because of the Occupy movements, should the the upper class pay more taxes? Um, let's actually think about this in terms of the different people involved. So obviously, if you want to tax them, they're going to be affected, right? Who else is in the picture? Middle and lower class. Okay, so middle and lower class. Or so. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll keep it pretty simple. What are the Occupy Wall Street people talking about? Who do they want to stick it to? All the rich people? Yeah. Like that higher 1%. Yeah. So we'll say that's 1%. And you now if you ask people, are you middle class? Most people actually think they're middle class, although demographically they're not. Um, but let's say that that's actually the truth that, um, let's say 60% our middle class, so that leaves us with 39% uh, being in the lower class. And you're going to place a greater burden on, on the rich. What do you think? What would be a good number? We're going to make this again really, really over simple. Uh, this is not the way 
taxes actually work. We're going to pretend that it actually is just like taking directly from the upper class and giving to the, the lower class. Um, would be a good round number to tax them with. The upper one percent. So these are people that have a lot of money. What do you think we ought to pick a number? As a whole? Uh, a billion dollars. A billion dollars? I don't know. Yeah, actually, a hundred million sounds more reasonable. All right, so everybody who's, say, got, you know, more than 100 million, we take, let's oh, we do it that that's a lot of zeros. Let's just take a million. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so minus a million is this much, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're going to be pretty upset. Right? <laughs> that's a lot of displeasure to them because that's a lot of stuff that they can't buy. And maybe they were counting on that. I mean, people get used to a certain lifestyle, and, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to conceive of, but, you know, people do want things to stay the same. Um, and we're going we're gonna to spread it out, and we'll give a little bit to the middle class. Like, we'll say, we'll give each person in the middle class a thousand bucks out of that. Probably not going to come out very easy. Uh, the lower class, I probably do maybe five thousand. Well, a lot of this money is getting uh, absorbed, then, right? Sure. Well, I mean, if you look at it like logically, you know, you have parks, you know, welfare, you know, all. Okay, the so this money stuff, is getting used so. for all sorts of other things, and so there's a there's a, a transfer of money. And then these, these other people are benefiting in other ways, too, from all of the parks, infrastructure, all that sort of stuff. And let's say that's actually worth to them something like an extra um, $10,000 a year. No. Let's say the government provides really lavish benefits. I mean, if you were going to uh, take a million bucks from each of the people <coughs> in the top 1%, that'd be an awful lot of money. And you could do an awful lot with it. And so it's not unreasonable to think that you might actually be able to provide like, you know, $10,000 worth of benefits to everybody. Um, now notice, this is only 1% of the population. They're probably going to be pretty ticked off, won't they? But they're only 1%. Look at all the other people and how happy you can make them. I mean, you know, you still have to look at the negative throwback to it because the top 1% might cut jobs to make up for the lack yeah. of profit. Yeah, there, and, and again, I was keeping this very, very simple just to illustrate what a utilitarian might do. You can think of other things, too. This is one of the things that can be troubling about utilitarianism. What if we use this classroom? And let's pretend that we're all you know, somewhat morally depraved. We enjoy um, we enjoy humiliating and denigrating and hurting other people, right? Um, <clears throat> we don't like it ourselves, but. You know, if, if we could just like pick one person in the class, um, we'll, we'll just pick one person and we'll inflict a lot of pain on them and a lot of humiliation. And that's going to feel good for us. Not as good for us individually as it feels bad for that person. It's going to feel really, really bad for them. But there's 21 of us, only one of them. You know, the happiness of the, the majority, or almost all of the community, shouldn't that outweigh the, the unhappiness of one person? Well, the utilitarian I mean, would say yes. Well, I mean, if you look at it, one person, compared one person to one person, yeah, then it may not equal out. Well, so then, you'd say, yeah, if you have five people versus one person, but everybody's matched up one versus one, 
Yeah. You know, it might not work out the same way. Well, but that's, if you're utilitarian, what you do is you want to look at everybody. So if you actually had five people, you'd have a community of five, and if one of them has pain and then the other four have pleasure because of a certain action, and those pleasures outweigh that pain, putting those pleasures together, adding them up, then it's, it's okay to do it. That, then it becomes the right thing to do. Um, that should be a little trouble. Now, Bentham actually does have ways of talking about that and getting uh, around that. But now notice, this is, in fact, a way in which we often do make moral decisions, don't we? Aren't a lot of government decisions made on this sort of basis? You look at everybody who's affected, and then you try to make it overall the best thing. It may be bad for some people, but overall, it increases the net happiness the aggregate. Don't businesses do this when they do cost-benefit analysis? Yeah. So this is a common mode of moral reasoning. And that's part of why we're, we're studying it. This is a legitimate moral theory. Uh, we're going to look at some more on uh, Thursday. We're going to look at how this affects, uh, how we evaluate individuals when it comes to this. And then we're going to look at John Stuart Mill. Mill's going to have a few criticisms of Bentham. Bentham puts everything on the same level. You could tally up all of your pleasures and pains against each other. In order for Bentham's system to work, that's one of the, the presuppositions. So I'll, I'll see all of you on uh, Thursday.